acting or deputy high commissioner of the UK to Jamaica, sorry, minister of legal and constitutional affairs, the Honorable Marlene Malibu Fort, head of the FID, head of uh, MOCA Customs, other agencies, ladies and gentlemen from the investigation fraternity, from the media, and those from financial institutions, good morning. I know that FID's budget did not allow them to serve breakfast, <laughs> but I could get a better good morning than that. Well, good morning. We have, to look, we have to look about the budget for the conference next time, uh, Selwyn. But let me just take this opportunity, first of all, to extend to the staff of the FID a very happy 21st, I believe, 20th birthday. Give them a round of applause, please. They've been around for 20 years. And during that time, they've established themselves as a courageous, a fiercely independent uh, investigative body that uh, Jamaica can have confidence in. We are here today talking about the Proceeds of Crime Act and the wider context in which this conversation is taking place is the context in which Jamaica has been strengthening or anti-money laundering and uh, countering of the financing of terrorism framework over the past several years. We would have received our second mutual evaluation in 2017 that found a number of deficiencies in our AML CFT framework. And we've been working feverishly since then with the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force and the Global Financial Action Task Force to address these. Over the course of this time, as we know, uh, just and we know, we uh, honest about everything, transparent about everything. Jamaica was actually grey listed, and what does grey listed mean? I mean, that's the colloquial term. It just means enhanced follow up, where Jamaica is required to make a high level political commitment that is public and internationally given that we will be making certain concrete steps to improve our AML and CFT framework. And across the breadth of government involving many, many departments and ministries, I can't mention them all, but I'll try, you know, from the BOJ to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the uh, DPP, Attorney General's Chambers, the FSC, um, Companies Office, Real Estate Board, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, the number of entities that have had to collaborate over the last few years to enact regulation, legislation, make procedural changes to improve Jamaica's AML CFT framework. Some of the things that we have done uh, include passing legislation and regulations to regulate the microcredit industry to ensure that microcredit cannot be used as a means of facilitating uh, the proceeds of crime passing through the Jamaican financial system. We have upgraded and, and reformed the Trust and uh, Corporate Services Providers Act and enacted a number of other regulatory and uh, legislative changes. A lot of what the FATF, oh, sorry, the weaknesses that Jamaica uh, was identified as having uh, back in 2017 had to do with the operationalizing as well of AML and CFT practices. And so, uh, through this uh, broad collaborative effort, we have improved on uh, the procedural requirements in the real estate sector, in the gaming sector, and as you have seen over the past several years, there has been a wider use of the poker legislation in the prosecution of crimes. And we have, uh, over that time, Jamaica has been, there are 40 recommendations overall, and I believe uh, back in 2017, we were compliant. And by the way, just to be full information, the, the report is dated 2017. I have to say this. But the evaluation would have been done a few years before that. But the report comes out in 2017. And when it came out, I think we were compliant or largely compliant. 
I'm going to look for some help here. In 20... No, no, in like, I think it was... No, no, no. In 2017, we were compliant or largely compliant. In, I think it was about 22 of the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, of the 40 recommendations. In 2017? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. In 2017, we were compliant or largely compliant in about 22 of the recommendations in 2017. And today, I believe with the latest review of where we are, we are compliant or largely compliant in 33 of the 40 recommendations, which rec represents some amount of progress. It represents some amount of progress. It's been a lot of work to get there. We had to complete one of the hardest things that, that Jamaica struggled with for a very long time was the completion of the national risk assessment, which uh, has to be done according to a specific format that our multilateral partners were very helpful in. And we were able to take a look at all sectors in Jamaica where money laundering risks uh, could lurk and produce our own assessment of the relative level of those risks across those sectors. So it's with some pride that we can say we are now compliant or largely compliant with 33 of the 40 and working very hard on the remaining recommendations. Uh, two of the, the principal ones we expect to be we have a commitment, certainly by, I think it's by March of this year, to, uh, to have the amendments to the Companies Act as regards beneficial ownership of companies for that amendment to be tabled and passed in Parliament. And uh, the minister responsible is Minister Aubin Hill that falls under his portfolio. I think we can expect to see uh, those amendments tabled within the time period that we have committed to. We also have the, the case that was heard in the UK Privy Council uh, about the applicability of the poker regulations to the legal profession. And that case was argued in November of last year, and we expect the judgment of the Privy Council to be handed out sometime uh, during this year, hopefully in the first half of this calendar year. And so it's my full expectation that before too long, Jamaica will raise its level of, uh, of uh, largely compliant and compliance you know, of the recommendations all the way up uh, to put us in a position where we can graduate uh, from this enhanced uh, supervision that Jamaica is under today. But recent events highlight the absolute importance of this agenda. It is sometimes frustrating. It is sometimes tedious. We sometimes wonder why we have to go through all of this. But I think it is very clear to everyone today that it ultimately serves our collective interest. It's not about the Europeans, nor is it about the Americans. It is about the Jamaicans. Because when there are questions about our regime here in Jamaica, the persons who are likely to suffer from such a reputation are the persons who live and make their livelihoods right here in Jamaica. And so it is in our interest to do everything that we can to strengthen Jamaica's AML and CFT regime. And you have a commitment from the government of Jamaica to work rigorously in that regard to ensure that we achieve these objectives. Now, last night at the 
birthday celebration for the FID, I was remarking to a few people who I was speaking to that the nature of what just transpired you know, has shocked the nation for a couple of reasons. For the long duration of this fraud, which from information in the public domain, we know to have lasted for at least 13 years, perhaps even longer. The second is the sheer magnitude of the fraud. This is not a market loss, like you know somebody went and bought some securities and they dropped in price. This is not a market loss, a foreign exchange loss, or a loss because of diminution in bond values or equity values. This is theft, fraud, and the sheer magnitude of it really has a fraud of this nature, really has little precedent over the last few decades in Jamaica. So the magnitude are shocking. And then, let's be honest, the nature of the victim was a source of one of the victims, was a source of shock. Because while he was winning gold medals for Jamaica in London, and we celebrated and we nationalized that victory and made it our own. There were people who were scheming and from all information that's in the public domain, pilfering and stealing and thieving from his account. In 2016, where he repeated for the third time that illustrious achievement, this robbery, was occurring. And this has just been a belly punch. It will shock the country. It will take us a long time to get over it. If any one of those three things happened, it would be a shock. If we had a, discovered a fraud that lasted in 13 years that was undetected, it would be a massive shock in itself. If we discovered an alleged fraud, a theft, to the scale of the numbers that have been banded around in the public domain, and the numbers I see in the public domain, two billion, three billion, whatever, that alone would be a shock. If we discovered that any one of our sports superstars who have achieved so much for us and who, in whom we vest so much national pride if we heard that any one of them were the subject or victim of fraud, that in itself would be shocking. To have all three of those ladies and gentlemen converge into one set of circumstances, the magnitude, the duration, and the nature of certainly one of the 40 victims identified so far makes it an earthquake, hurricane, natural disaster proportions. But we will not make this go to waste. We won't make this experience go to waste. As uncomfortable, uneasy, saddening, depressing, disappointing, vexing as it is, for one thing, it shows that we need the entire edifice of entities to collaborate to ensure that we have the kind of integrity in our financial sector that we need. We need compliance officers at financial institutions. We need financial institutions themselves, law enforcement agencies, competent authorities, regulators, managers, directors. We need everybody to be paying attention and to be collaborating. The duration of this fraud over 13 years highlights why due diligence is important and why enhanced due diligence is doubly important. And again, it can be frustrating. 
to the individual, to the company, to the institution. Why they want us bother with this? Don't make any sense. But what we have learned through this experience that it is not about you. It's not about you. It is about Jamaica. That is what it is about. Because confidence, as far as the financial sector is concerned, is a fragile commodity. And if that commodity is damaged, it is Jamaica that suffers. So when we put provisions in place that require due diligence and enhance due diligence, and you get frustrated or your clients get frustrated, just say to them, it's not about you. Not about you. It is about Jamaica. And because it is about Jamaica, the government has given its commitment. I have given my commitment as Minister of Finance and Public Service. The Prime Minister has given his commitment that in this case, no stone will be left unturned. By the time I spoke last Monday, the investigative bodies were already in touch and collaborating with the FBI. And that, those, that collaboration has continued with meetings that have followed. And in the briefing that I have received, based on developments, the FBI is going to be intensifying their involvement even beyond what would have been thought when I first made that statement. Further to the commitment I made last week Monday, not only have we written to an international partner for assistance with forensic auditing, but I've committed publicly that the government of Jamaica is going to be paying for it, meaning we are, if somebody wants to give us, uh, we will take it, of course, right? But this is so important, we are going to allocate the space in our budget to make sure we can procure the best international forensic experts that we can find. And since that time, we have identified a firm and the Procedures involved in contracting are underway. Further updates will be provided. The cyber resources and cyber forensic resources of the government of Jamaica have also been activated. And all avenues that cyber can reach, and I don't have to specify them, all of them will be opened up with no stone left unturned. There's going to be no place to hide. Now, one of the things that is a bit puzzling is that in the largest private sector corruption that we have seen in recent times, everybody is talking about the government. In the largest case of private sector corruption in the country, the conversation is about the government. Let me tell you something. We're not going to be distracted by that. Directors and managers and persons responsible will have to provide an account for their stewardship. At various points over the 13 years, and we have taken a very transparent approach with respect to the FSC's role over those 13 years. But at various points, they would have directed that an audit be conducted. External audits, 
natural requirement, but they directed for special audits to be conducted. They directed that the off-balance sheet book be audited as late as January of 2020. The firm went out, it got the services of external auditors, and it audited the off-balance sheet book. Client assets were seen as $34 billion, not client assets, sorry. The assets in the off-book balance sheet were $34 billion, and the client liabilities were $34 billion. Everything matched. After equity adjustments, the client assets, or the assets belong to clients, $31 billion. Phrase that. The assets in the off-balance sheet book after equity adjustment, $31 billion. The liabilities in the off-balance sheet book, $31 billion. Now, none of what I'm to say is to cast aspersions on any auditor. But there are questions that have to be answered if we are to live up to our creed that no stone will be left unturned. The, audit, the auditors will not escape scrutiny in this matter. And the procedures used to provide audits will not escape scrutiny. The regulators depend on third parties to provide external audits. If there's a direction to get an audit and the audit comes back satisfactory, the FSC cannot act on that point. On the other hand, if an audit is directed and the audit cannot come back, the FSC has an avenue to act on that point. Am I clear? So not casting aspersions, but there are questions that have to be answered as to why this wasn't detected by external auditors, by special auditors, by internal auditors over a long period of time. And the reason is not to cast blame on anybody, but to understand the weaknesses in the private sector that exist that we have got to take action on as far as regulation, or other means at our disposal. And we will not get there if we don't turn over the stones. So because this is about Jamaica, we have to ensure that we ad address this in an honest, open, and transparent manner, where we don't seek to politicize it. Seeking to politicize it will only allow things that need to be exposed, will only allow them to be hidden because the attention of the public will be distracted to areas that do not offer the real answers. I suspect that we'll be talking about this for some time to come. And I know and I, I believe that the investigators before too long will be in a position to address the country. But the best that we can do coming out of this situation as a country is to learn from it and to make sure that Jamaica is stronger as a result of it. And that is my commitment to you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.